you want to take your Bibles out and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. But always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This passage is kind of a package description of of the Christian life and what that means and what that looks like. There's a lot of challenges that that go along with it. And there's one part in here that kind of stands out, especially in a Thanksgiving season, and that's verse 18. We're told to give thanks in all circumstances. And as we approach Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving holiday, Holidays can be kind of a difficult time, especially when there's been loss or some difficulty in our lives recently. And so when we go through these holidays, how do we give thanks when there's been some pretty difficult things that we've faced? It says give thanks in all circumstances. You're undergoing some sort of a crisis. This can almost sound like a a cruel joke or something, can it? How do you give thanks when something very near and dear is gone? How do you give thanks when living moment to moment, you're watching as a catastrophe just unfolds before you? How do you give thanks when you're in so much pain that you can hardly even move? Well, I want to reinforce, first of all, that it's still okay to cry. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean that nothing sad ever happens to us. We can cry and we can mourn and we can grieve. That doesn't mean we're not Christians. It doesn't mean that we don't have faith. We're not forbidden to mourn. In fact, just in the chapter beforehand here, it says in chapter 4, verse 13, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant of those who fall asleep. You're talking about, about death. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. It doesn't say that you're not allowed to grieve. It says we grieve differently. We still grieve, but we do so in a different way. It's okay to cry, but Christian mourning is very different from that of of other people. When when you're Christian, when when you have your faith in Jesus Christ, grieving and mourning and, and loss takes on a whole different character. And our attitudes toward adversity and difficulty should be distinct from, from the rest of the world. We should be standing out, really, because of what Christ is and who, what he has done for us. So, like, in other, in other world views that are, that are not Christian, grieving and, and loss kind of takes a different character. In Hinduism or Buddhism, if you have difficult circumstances, that means it's karma, Karma is at work, and uh, if some bad things happen to you, you deserve it. You must have done something in some previous life that earned you or merited you this bad circumstance. And so in certain countries, when people get in a car accident on the side of the road, 
People don't stop to help. They'll stop to pillage and to steal. Because if you've had a car accident, you must have done something bad to deserve it. Or if you're in secular, if you're a secular person, if you just don't believe in God at all, difficult circumstances are somebody else's fault. It's never your fault. It's always somebody else's. So, for example, McDonald's didn't tell me that the coffee was going to be hot. It's their fault. Or, there should be a law requiring me to have my house built on stilts because of flooding. Or, people are misusing guns. It's the gun's fault. I think a lot of you would identify with that. Or, my favorite one, it's affluenza's fault. Maybe you've heard of that news story. My parents' wealth kept me from learning right and wrong, and so that's why I stole two cases of beer, illegally drove intoxicated on a restricted license, speeding, and plowed into a group of people, killing four of them and injuring nine. If you don't believe in God at all, it's somebody else's fault. If you're a Christian... In Christ, difficult circumstances are permitted by a heavenly Father for a purpose. As much as we might not like them, as much as we might not enjoy them, we know that in Christ, God has purposes and he has plans. Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father? And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And in Hebrews 12, Hebrews is written to people who were being persecuted for their faith, almost to the point of being killed for it. It says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. Because of what they were suffering, because of their faith, it seems kind of shocking that that they would hear that. God is treating us as sons and daughters. Well, we heard Matthew's profession of faith, and um, Matthew, Matthew's uh, one of the black belts in, in our martial arts class. And in our martial arts class, we do difficult things on purpose. We, we do push-ups that strengthen our muscles. We hold positions for a long time and just stay there to concentrate. We do difficult things on purpose. Why? So that we will improve. That we will get stronger. Somehow, all of the difficulties that that we face are permitted by our Heavenly Father for some purpose of some kind. And we can trust Him in that. And we can even give thanks in those circumstances. And I have a story that I want to read to you. It's, uh, it's just a bit long, but this is from The Hiding Place. This is written by Corey Ten Boom. Some of you have probably read this book before. Who's read The Hiding Place before? Okay, quite a few. There's one part in here that explicitly references this passage. They're, they're in the concentration camp. She and her sister... Betsy, and then they were just moved to a new camp, and this happens. We lay back, struggling against the nausea that swept over us from the reeking straw. Suddenly I sat up, striking my head on the cross slats above. Something had pinched my leg. Fleas, I cried. Betsy, the place is swarming with them. Here, and here another one, I wailed. Betsy, how can we live in such a place? Show us, show us how. It was said so matter-of-factly, it took me a second to realize she was praying. More and more, the distinction between prayer and the rest of life seemed to be vanishing for Betsy. 
Corey, she says excitedly, he has given us the answer before we asked, as he always does. In the Bible this morning, where was it? Read that part again. I glanced down the long, dim aisle to make sure no guard was in sight, then drew the Bible from its pouch. It was in 1 Thessalonians, I said. In the feeble light, I turned the pages. Here it is. Comfort the frightened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Go on, said Betsy. That wasn't all. Oh, yes. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's it, Corey. That's his answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we can do. We can start right now to thank God for every single thing about this new barracks. I stared at her, then around me at the dark, foul-aired room. Such as, I said, such as being assigned here together. I bit my lip. Oh yes, Lord Jesus. Such as what you're holding in your hands. I looked down at the Bible. Yes, thank you, dear Lord, that there was no inspection when we entered here. Thank you for all of these women here in this room who will meet you in these pages. Yes, said Betsy. Thank you for the very crowding here since we were packed so close that many more will hear. She looked at me expectantly. Corey, she prodded. Oh, all right, thank you for the jammed, crammed, stuffed, packed, suffocating crowds. Thank you, Betsy went on serenely. For the fleas, and for the fleas, this was too much. Betsy, there is no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. Give thanks in all circumstances, she quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. Fleas are part of this place where God has put us. And so we stood beside tiers of bunks and gave thanks for fleas. But this time I was sure Betsy was wrong. And then it goes on to talk about the worship services that they had in the barracks. They were services like no others, these times in barracks 28. At first, Betsy and I called these meetings with great timidity, but as night after night went by and no guard ever came near us, we drew bolder. So many now wanted to join us that we had held a second service after evening roll call. We were under rigid surveillance, guards in their warm wool capes marching constantly up and down, it was the same in the center room of the barracks, half a dozen guards or camp police always present, yet in the large dormitory room, there was almost no supervision at all. We did not understand it. One evening, I got back to the barracks late from a wood-gathering foray outside the walls. A light snow lay on the ground, and it was hard to find the sticks and twigs with which a small stove was to be kept going in each room. Betsy was waiting for me, as always, so that we could wait through the food line together, her eyes twinkling. You're looking extraordinary, extraordinarily pleased with yourself, I told her. You know, we have never understood why we had so much freedom in the big room, she said. Well, I found out. That afternoon, she said, there'd been confusion in, in her knitting group about sock sizes, and they'd asked the supervisor to come and settle it, but she wouldn't. She wouldn't step through the door, and neither would the guards. And do you know why? Betsy could not keep the triumph from her voice. Because of the fleas. That's what she said. That place is crawling with fleas. My mind rushed back to our first hour in this place. I remembered Betsy's bowed head. Remembered her thanks to God for creatures I could see no use for. You're in a concentration camp. You're starving. You're crowded. You're treated like animals. You're probably going to die. And here is somebody who found something to be thankful for, many things to be thankful for, even in those circumstances, even for fleas. Truth is stranger than fiction, isn't it? If this were made up, it wouldn't be very believable even. But that really happened. God is love. God is in control. And God knows what he's doing. Our job is to be faithful, obedient, and steadfast. I was visiting with Trina Tolman this week. 
And she's had her fair share of, of adversity. She's lost her husband to cancer and her son to cancer. And now she uh, has a broken knee for the third time in three years. And I was trying to empathize with her and saying, you know, that must be really tough, that what you're going through right now. And she said, well, everything happens for a reason. She said it very confidently, almost like she was reminding me of that. Don't underestimate that. Everything happens for a reason. It says in our passage, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Giving thanks in all circumstances is possible because of Christ Jesus. It doesn't just say this is God's will for you. It says this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is why. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. The answer to all of our problems is Christ Jesus. He is our only comfort in life and in death. And yes, we look for a lot of other comforts in life and we kind of hang on and seek after those. But at the end of the day, he's our only comfort in life and in death. He is the answer to all of our problems. Jesus Christ, he is the Son of God made human like us. That means that he knows what it's like. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just like we are, except was without sin. In Christ, God came to us and shares our sufferings. We don't have a God who's distant and aloof and doesn't know what it's like and just gives us commands. We have a God who actually became one of us and walked among us and carried our diseases. He faced our temptations, walked our paths, and doesn't leave us alone. Our God isn't distant. He's a God who's close. He knows what it's like. He shared our sufferings. The cross. Can't talk about Jesus very well without the cross, can we? That means his suffering and death was his finest hour. What should have been his defeat was his victory. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He faced the cross. He scorned its shame and went straight for it. If we're in Christ, that's true for us too. In Christ, sufferings are strength and defeats are victories. When we're in Christ, those things are reversed. Jesus died on the cross. That means the world can do its worst to us, and in Christ we will be more than conquerors through it. Severe sufferings and death will befall us, but in faith and obedience and perseverance, we overcome by God's power. That's what the cross means. It turns everything upside down. And then there was an empty tomb. We can't talk about Jesus without talking about his resurrection. The world did its worst, and Jesus still arose. The end of the story for him was exactly the same. It didn't matter what happened to him all the way up. The end was still the same. He still arose, and he arose even better than he was before. In Christ, that's true for all of us too. No matter what happens between now and the end of this life for us, the end is going to be the same. We're all going to rise out of our graves someday. Our, our caskets are going to be empty. And we are going to rise with better bodies than we have now. And nothing's going to change that. It doesn't matter what happens between now and then. That is going to be the same no matter what. In Christ, the end of our story is always the same. Jesus rose from the dead no matter what happens. 
our end is the same. Death will not have the final word with us. And it's because of Christ Jesus, who has won all of this for us, that we can give thanks in all circumstances, because no matter what circumstances we have, these things never change. These are always there. I subscribe to a magazine that talks about, gives testimonies of people who are being persecuted because of their faith. And it's always surprising to me at the faith that these people have in the face of terrible adversity and terrible suffering and terrible loss. There's one man named Daniel who's in Nigeria. His wife died because Boko Haram surrounded his home and wouldn't let her out for treatment. It says, the loss really shocked me. I was not able to eat, drink, or sleep for three days, but I encouraged myself in the Lord and God strengthened me. He has many family members that were killed. His brother was shot by Boko Haram for reading his Bible. His sister was kidnapped, witnessed many many killings, and has mental trauma. There was another brother who was stopped by Boko Haram, and he disappeared. His father was shot and killed for refusing to denounce Christ. And listen to what this guy Daniel says. My internal joy remains constant. I always thank the Lord for giving me the opportunity to partake in Christ's suffering. I don't even mind the hardest. Does that just blow your mind? That's giving thanks in all circumstances, isn't it? This is what Jesus Christ can do. This is what he has done. This is what that means for us. There's the power there. And I don't understand it fully, but it's there. It's real. And we can plug into it, just like this man Daniel can. Nothing can take us from the eternal treasure that is Jesus Christ. Verse 17, it says, pray continually. When gratitude escapes you, turn to prayer. Turn to prayer. There will be times when we will be overwhelmed with sadness and be discouraged, when we will be worried, overwhelmed with stress, and so forth. There will be times like that. When gratitude escapes us, prayer is what we turn to. If you have no faith left in you at all, you can still pray. And like Betsy in that concentration camp, the distinction between prayer and the rest of life disappears. We can always pray. Look at the screen here with me and let's answer the question together. Why do Christians need to pray? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us. And also because God gives His grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking Him for them. Prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness that we can give back to God. The most important part. And God gives His grace and His Holy Spirit to us when we do that. Even if we're not noticing it, God is there. The most important part of our gratitude to God is talking with Him. In this Thanksgiving season, let's remember that. Let's remember that in our prayer times, that this is the most important part of giving thanks to God, is talking with Him, responding to Him, engaging Him, asking Him for things, calling on Him. Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. And the passage that we looked at last week, how can I repay the Lord for all His goodness to me? The gratitude. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. We call on Him. That's our gratitude. We call on Him. So in good times and bad, 
get to know the Lord whose eternal blessings are beyond our imagination. Get to know the Lord. Talk to Him. Interact with Him. 2 Corinthians 4 says it really well. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in His presence. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And this part gets me all the time. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The troubles that we're experiencing right now are light and momentary. And they're achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. I don't get it, but that's what it says. That's the truth that is God's word. In every prayer, in every circumstance, give thanks for Jesus Christ. Give thanks for Him. Because no matter what else is going on in your life, even if you're in a concentration camp and you're looking at death, He walks with us in our troubles, He gives us victory, and He gives us a guaranteed end that's even better than anything here. That's what He does for us. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray and give thanks. Lord God in heaven, thank you for being our God. Thank you for Jesus Christ and the gift that he is. Thank you for forgiveness of sins, for his death on the cross, for his resurrection. And Lord, as we celebrate in Christmas in a, in a month time, Lord, that he even walked among us and was one of us. He knows what it's like. Please don't leave us alone in our troubles and in our sufferings. Remind us, Lord, that you walk with us in them. And Lord, help us to always give you thanks for all that you've done. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.